welcome to the all the book lovers and the avid readers to the opening chapter of the association book clubs in the first online event i'm hoysala and i'm delighted to be your host for the first inaugural event where we aim to bring together all the book clubs in india under one umbrella and bring community of readers and also promote the joy of reading before we dwell into the session with our special very special guest for today uh, let's take a moment to understand the goals and objectives of abcs and the future vision we have set for ourselves abc is an, is an initiative by food for thought foundation it's a non-profit organization dedicated to igniting the reading revolution in india with the mission to connect idle books to hungry minds they particularly work towards restoring endangered books reigniting the joy of reading through storytelling session and building libraries in schools and communities across india so this dedication brought for the vision to build the association book club as a platform dedicated to rekindling the reading as a primary objective of building a bond among book lovers and book clubs in india and creating a united front for sharing more book lovers to all events across pan india so abc's book clubs will have an access to platforms where they can share their best practices show their activities in a shared calendar and attract new members we believe this will provide a space where concerns and observations can be shared among fellow book enthusiasts so hope that paints the picture of why we are here today and our objective for today abc is also one of our main goals is to build an independent board consisting of registered book clubs ensuring that everybody in the community is heard and represented and we can educate towards the joy of reading books so we also plan to host an india reading carnival and also reading marathons we, we have a lot lot of exciting stuff coming up and we want to celebrate and the spread of uh, joy of reading so that's why we're here today and for this inaugural we have uh, we're hosting a fireside chat with two very young authors zag sangeet and nayab suhail who have taken the literary world by storm they will be sharing their insights experiences and inspirations with us for the next 30 to 40 minutes and following their conversation we'll have an opportunity for you the audience to ask questions and interact with them you can also post your questions in chat where i can read them out so that they can answer them so let's give it to the special guests of the first ever inaugural session uh, i'll just can you guys give me a second Yes. Hi Zach, hi Nayab. Hello. Good to see the both of you. Nice to meet you too. So Same. let me Yeah. Thank you Nayab. Let me give like a brief introduction of both these young authors that we have today on the panel. So Zach Sangeet is one of the world's youngest historians. He's the author of World History in 3 points. and more world history in three points uh, which is and hidden links penguins to 20, 2023 his books have been translated into more than 10 languages he is also an scm youth fellow and a winner of the indian reading olympiad as a public speaker he has spoken in various forums such as global shapers of the world economic forum so thank you zach for being here with us thank you for agreeing to do this it's it's very impressive profile that we have seen of you so thank you for being here and I'm coming to yeah and coming to nayab so hell she is a remarkably talented writer and artist with an impressive list of achievements from a young age her work has been featured in prominent publications such as the telegraph the shillong times and meghalaya times she has received numerous accolades including the second position in an international halloween story contest and Nayab's writing prowess was recognized when she won an All India Essay Competition organized by Atomic Minerals Directorate for Exploration and Research. She also has been awarded as Author of the Week and the first runner-up Author of the Year 2020 by Story Mirror Deb. And her debut book, 
Flamingo in Vamp Prickle Land showcases her talent as one of the youngest authors from Meghalaya. Nayaf's position and passion for reading and writing shines through and she aspires to ignite a reading revolution in India, sharing the joy of reading with others through her works. So, thank you Nayaf for being here. Thank you. So, just a reminder that we'll be taking the audience questions also in the chat. So, even while we're having the uh, panel, you are please welcome to put your questions in chat. So, Zach and Nayab, we're just delighted to have you here. And it's so great to uh, know both of you and, and the impressive work that you have done. And you guys have achieved so much at a young age. So, could you tell us, like, you know, a few interesting stories or uh, anecdotes throughout your writing journey and what sparked off the joy of writing for you? We'll start off with Zach. My defining moment was when my parents came back from a trip to Paris. My mother usually has a habit of showing me the pictures of her trip. And one of those pictures was that of the Mona Lisa. I was intrigued by this and started wondering why exactly was this painting so famous? I started delving into it, researching about it. And that's when I realized that to understand about the Mona Lisa, I must also understand about its artist, Leonardo da Vinci, and the era in which it was painted, the Renaissance. Slowly, I started delving an interest into the whole of history. And during the COVID period, when we had online classes, I started writing essays on history. I started distilling it into three simple points. These essays were later compiled into a book and published by the second largest publisher in the world, Hachette. That's great. I mean, uh, coming from the inspiration of, you know, your mom's trips and that inspiring you to write stories and exploring them. That's, I think that's a wonderful experience. Nayaf, can we have your story? Can we have like, how did you, what sparked off your interest to pursue writing? Hi, I'm Nayab Suhail and I'm speaking from heaven. Oh wait, I haven't kicked the bucket so soon. I mean, I'm speaking from the heaven on earth that is Jannate Kashmir. So you see, uh, I'm my parents' only child. And uh, since my father was in a transferable job, he was in BSF or a security force, we had to change places after every three years. I had to change schools and it was quite challenging, you see because it's very difficult to make friends every now and then. So this had, I had uh, become quite, uh, I was quite a lonely child, you can say. So my mother started noticing that I was becoming quite depressed and then she gave me books. She was the one who introduced me to the world of books. And so what happened uh, one day, when I was in class seven and there was nothing to do, I was feeling quite bored. So I borrowed a page from my classmate and I felt like, okay, I have read so many books of so many different authors. So why not try something different, something myself, which I can create, where I can be the creator of a new world. So I started writing a story. At that time, I didn't know that it would become, it would be uh, turned into a book. So when I showed it to my mother, she was really amazed and she encouraged me to write more stories. So my mother told me uh, an incident. Uh, when I was one year old, I'm sorry, actually, I have got a terrible cold. Oh, that's fine. Uh, when I was one year old, my mother had taken me to a mall and while she was busy choosing clothes for me, I had gone and picked up a book, a big picture book. And my mother was a bit shocked so it was then that my mother bought me that book and I developed the habit of reading so you see uh, when people started appreciating my writing I started winning awards first at the school level then at the state level then at the national level and finally at the international level it boosted my morale and I knew that writing was my passion and I couldn't live without it That's a lovely story. Uh, thank you for taking us through both of your stories. 
uh, I would ask more about your, you know, your debut books, like Zach, your debut book was World History in Three Points and Nayab's was uh, Flamingo in Vampirical Land. So how how did that start? How did you like uh, use your imaginative ideas and put them on paper? And how did that turn into eventually a book that you could publish? So if you could take us through that process, that would be great. Zach, we can go with you first. When I was um, around six years old, at this right after I started developing an interest in history, right after my mother showed me the picture of the Mona Lisa, my teacher started complaining about my handwriting skills. I didn't have proper motor skills. I couldn't hold a pencil properly. My teacher said that every day I should write uh, an entire page on any topic I wanted. I chose to write about a new topic on history every day because I was developing a deep interest in it. And so every day after I came back home, I would research on a topic and try to write it down. But that's when I realized the problem with history. History is long, it's verbose. And that's why the modern generation doesn't like it. It's because it's impossible to comprehend in a simple three minutes. And so, I started researching and writing history, but I would distill it into three simple points. The past, the present, and the future. What happened before an event, what happened during the event, and what happened after the event. During my online classes, since I had much more time, because it online classes, would you would only have around three hours of class, while in a physical class, you would have six hours. I started using my spare time to begin writing more and more essays. I wrote about philosophers, economists, sociologists, thinkers, emperors and empires. And slowly, after I had a pretty big compilation of books, the French publisher Hachette approached me and thus my first book, World History in Three Points, came out. My second book, More World History in Three Points, was the remaining of essays I had because I still hadn't lost my last to write. I wrote more and my second book was published. That's, I think, really, really amazing. And I'll, I'll come up to the follow-up question to that about, you know, uh, history being a little difficult for to comprehend for a lot of people. But I think let's go with Naya for the same question. Walk us through your first debut book, Nayab. Yes, yeah, so my first book, Slamango and Bamprical Land. You see, from the very beginning, uh, I had a fascination for witches and wizards because I wanted to dispel the notion that all witches are not, all witches are bad. Some people think, I mean, many of them think that witches, they are ugly, they cast spell on humankind. But I wanted to dispel that notion. So, the book, Flamingo and Vampirical Land, is about two young witches, Flamingo and Calera, who travel to a different world, which is a Vampirical Land, where a competition takes place as to who would be the best witch of the year and who could brew the best spell and uh, make surprises of surprises. So Flamingo there, she wins the first prize, but that's not the main thing. The main part of the story is the journey for, uh, to the Vampirical Land. And how she became the world's best witch. So you see, basically, uh, you'll be amazed that it might it might sound a bit weird that my ideas come to me while I'm studying, and then there's no stopping me, for I pick up a pen and jot down my ideas then and there. And my parents don't discourage me for it. So I feel, yeah, that was my starting point. That's great. I think uh, we've seen how the both of you, your parents have played a very nurturing role and the environment that contributed to you to be eventually a uh, writer. And I think we have our first question from our audience. As, and it says, how much help did you get from a, a teacher or any mentor in framing a sequence or a flow of the book? So if you, if any of both of you could elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, I, I got a lot of, in fact, my teachers at school were very supportive. 
whenever I brought out an essay or read it in front of class, they would immediately suggest edits. Uh, they would tweak it a bit, show me places where I could improvise, etc. But I think majority of where I started becoming better is with my uh, with the team behind my book, the team of editors. They would. Um, the best part is that I not only made my book better, but I also learned a lot in the journey while publishing the book with them. They uh, would give me interesting facts, uh, anecdotes, stories. They would tell me where I could tweak, where I could make my grammar better, where I could make my facts better. Uh, yeah, I think those were the important mentors of my writing journey. And of course, my parents. That's great. Naya, would you like to take that question? Yes. Well, I was not as lucky as Zach to have um, encouraging teachers, but my mother and my father, they were my biggest teachers. Biggest teachers, school teachers I have usually seen, they stress on uh, reading the school books, like books on science and books on maths. They think that books are only about scientific formulas and mathematical uh, formulas, but I feel that's not the case. My mother uh, introduced when my mother introduced me to, to the world of books, I first started reading books of Enid Blyton. And then I realized that books are something different. Books are magical. And beca because you can find uh, within the pages of books, you can find fairies to be made friends with, magical castles to be explored, and spectacular mysteries to be solved. So books were not altogether about science and about maths. Books were something else altogether and which something which people fail to realize. So Yes, I think that my mother was my biggest teacher. I think it's amazing to see, uh, you know, two different perspectives that you, uh, young authors, because we, Zach, we can see that, you know, you come from a very non-fiction background. And Naya, we can see that she's coming from a very uh, fantasy fiction background. So it's very interesting to see this two diverse worlds meeting. And it's great to have be to be in conversation with both of you uh i would like to ask zach a question now that you know how do you make historical context appealing to the uh readers especially the younger readers because non-fiction isn't the first book they pick up because that isn't uh it could be a little difficult but you started off with having a, a historical non-fiction book out so how do you make it more appealing to your audience I have to be frank, being a 12-year-old, I have a really short attention span. I always thought that this was only for me. But when I started going out, socializing a bit more with my friends, I learned that this, this was the problem with the modern generation, that Twitter and Instagram had shortened their attention span. And that's where I realized why exactly people didn't like history. History is long. History is verbose. And in this world where you can instantly understand a Twitter, Twitter thread, you can instantly watch an Instagram reel and learn something. In history, you have to read thousands or even hundreds or even thousands of pages just to learn a simple fact. Like, for example, in Genghis Khan, to understand a few key ideas, you would have to go through hundreds and thousands of pages. What I did is that I tried to make history more suitable for short attention spans. I started distilling my ideas into three simple points. I think being a storyteller, Nayab would know, but um, I believe that all important stories have three important points. Uh, and most storytellers use is the situation, the complication, and the solution. What's going on? What is the problem and how is that problem solved? Genghis Khan is a boy in the um, in the in the steps, step region. That would be the situation. The complication is that his throne is usurped by his brothers, cousins, and uncles. And the solution is that he gets his throne back and expands his empire to the whole of the world, making the largest contiguous land empire. But then what I realized is that this story fashion would only work for empires and emperors whose story you need to tell. But for people like philosophers and thinkers, economists and sociologists, 
this wouldn't work because you also have to talk about their works. So I made a past, present, and future format. The three parts of time. The past would be what happened before the person. The present, what did the person do during the person's time? And the future, how has that person or event made an impact on our world? That's very interesting. And I think you broke it down pretty well for even like, you know, uh, really uh, beginner readers to even like uh, who are readers who are very experienced. I think that's pretty impressive. And I think that you get when you look at it from a writer's perspective and that's what we were looking at here. And uh, I I do have a lot of follow-up questions, but let's go, to, go ask Nayab also. Nayab, is there a similar process that you follow for your writing? And like, because yours is more fictional, do you derive, like, how is the world building and how do you, like, develop your characters in your stories? Well, uh, as I told earlier, I was an avid reader. And after reading so many books of so many different authors, like the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling, uh, books by Chris Colfer, Enid Blyton, Roald Dahl, David Volumes, ideas, they started brewing in my mind. And I started imagining things. Because you see, I I let my ideas run wild because a story is a story. It can be woven around any idea or ideas. All that matters is how you put it into words. Is all that matters is how you put your imagination, your ideas into words, and how you portray it to the readers. And as for my character building process, I try to build my characters in such a way that uh, they look interesting uh, to the readers and the readers can relate it to themselves and the readers can see the characters in front of themselves before they rise and, the, and they can see the story revolving in front of them. Okay. I think that's, that's, that's quite an interesting take on uh, how you uh, develop your characters. And uh, Zach, I'd like to, you know, ask you for a question that, you know, uh, because it's historical nonfiction and there's so much misinformation around and how do you do your research? Like, how do you segregate the storytelling aspect of your book and also the factual accuracy of it? So how, uh, and let me know if there are any more uh, historical uh, periods that you want to explore since you, you were speaking about Genghis Khan and all of that and even in your books, uh, the periods that you have covered. So, Talk me through your historical uh, explorations and how you how you do research for your books. What you're saying is very true. History involves a lot of storytelling. People have their own agendas and they want to show that. And so being a person who studies actively history, it's very tough to, to differentiate fiction from nonfiction. But the way I fact check is a very simple way. What I do is that I go to a website, uh, like for example, a Wikipedia, which is not believed, which is not trusted. Over there, I find skeletal information, a base, a body from, from which I can develop. Then I go into the bibliography, the source, and I start to delve deeper and deeper. I go source by source until I reach a primary source a first-hand source. Until I reach that place, I fact check every point until I realize whether something is true or false. Let me give you an example. The notion in which the world perceives Ashoka right now is that he was a peaceful, benevolent ruler. He was supposed to have ascended the throne after the death of his father, Bindusara, he killed all his uncles and brothers to get the throne. But then during a war in Kalinga, he realized all the violence that he had committed. And he decided to lead a peaceful life after that by adopting Buddhism. But when I researched on this, I realized that this might not be true at all. And in fact, there were lots of historians out there who supported this. Ashoka, even after converting to Buddhism, is supposed to have conducted pogroms. And apart from that, he's also supposed to have killed 
non-Buddhists, people who did not support his religion. And I think that a lot of agenda, a lot of people's own agenda is behind making history into a story, into a fic into fiction. A period in which I would really want to delve into um, about that, I think it would be the point of time from around 600 to 300 BCE. In my next book, I term this era as the fountainhead epoch, the fountainhead of all the evolution of everything that will come to humanity between 600 to 300 BCE, from Hellenism to democracy, from the Republic, Stoic philosophy, everything comes in from this point of time from 300 to 600, from 600 to 300 BCE, the fountainhead epoch. Wow, I mean, uh, you took us through that entire story. And I think when I'm sure the readers are excited to read your new works and even the your previous works. So I think that that's really interesting how you like put in through the you gave us an example of how you know, uh, of uh, Ashoka and you put it through. So like, there's so many explorations that are happening. So there's a lot of this, there's this perception and the perspective of right and wrong. And it's, and as a writer, you have to distill both of those perspectives and derive uh, conclusions from it in your book. And I think from a three point view and even the uh, example that you've just given us, I think it shows the credibility of your writing and how you're putting in your thoughts uh, with so much responsibility. And for that for a young age, I think is pretty impressive, Zach. So thank you for sharing that with us. And Nayab, I have another question for you. So we've, we've seen the environment that you uh, that has nurtured your writing and you've grown up in uh, you've grown up in different places, you've seen different places and you've read about fantasy lands and that fascinated you to you know create your own worlds. So uh, tell us this transition because you've written you've won so, so many awards for your essays and then tell us the transition from your essay writing to your you know, to becoming a full-fledged author of like so many books so tell us that transition how was that you see uh, my the supportive uh, the nurturing environment has undoubtedly played an, a very important role and my parents have always encouraged me you see the uh, the natural environment in which i grew up that has also played a very important role i was i grew up in a camp I had a confined life. Camps, you know, they are generally situated far away from the city. And hence, I was always away from all the distractions of today's world. So when I went to Meghalaya, I noticed the natural beauty there, the rolling hills, the pine trees, the cherry blossoms, the wildflowers. All those things fascinated me a lot. And when I first sent my story here on the, here, the Secret Planet to the Shillong Times, they liked it and they published it in the Sunday edition. So thereafter, I uh, started sending more stories and they started publishing it. So I would always look forward to the Sunday edition with my uh, name on the newspaper. So um, uh, uh, the editor of the uh, Sunday Shillong, which is Patricia Mukhim, ma'am, uh, she's a Padma Shri awardee. She encouraged me to write more and she asked me to write something on Meghalaya. Now Meghalaya, you might find it a bit boring, a name too boring. You might be thinking that, okay, it's a state of Northeast. So what can be so special about it? Northeast is a backward place and there's no progress there. But I feel that's wrong because Meghalaya, according to me, is the most beautiful place. And when I started discovering more about the place, when I started learning about its culture, its tradition, I was quite amazed. You see, there's a, a village in Meghalaya called the Whistling Village, where the people, they don't call each other by names. Rather, they have a specific tune with the help of which they call each other. That fascinated me a lot. And plus the matrilineal society of Meghalaya was quite remarkable. Like in today's world, men, they are the rulers of the land. Uh, and after marriage, the women are the one to go to the in-laws. But in Meghalaya, uh, things were quite different. Because after marriage, it was the groom who had to go to his in-laws. It was the uh, 
the youngest daughter, she was the one to inherit all the property. The children, they inherited their mother's surname. And so basically, you can say that women uh, rule the land. So Meghalaya inspired me to write my third book, that is In the Abode of Flowers. This is the book. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Can you like take us through the pages? Because I think it will fascinate our readers to read your book even a bit more. Uh, stages in what sense? The pages of your book. Okay, yeah. the pages. Right. So do I have to read an excerpt from it? or? Oh, sure, page? sure. You can. Even Zach, please, uh, you know, you could actually open up a copy of your book and show it to our readers. Uh, we'd be more than happy to if you re read something that you really like from your book too. Yeah, surely. Okay, uh, I'll read the last page of my book. Okay. This is the note actually. Ah, it's true, absolutely true that nothing lasts forever. It hardly takes time for a blooming tree to wither away or a young maiden's hand to wrinkle. I did believe in the line that nothing lasts forever, but only till a few years ago, until I fell in nature's lap in Meghalaya. The rolling hills, the blue skies, and the sweet smell of the pine trees have influenced me so much that even at this age, I dream of fairies and unicorns rather than Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The beautiful memories of Meghalaya linger on in my mind, still fresh and clear as the river Umgot and Doki. And these memories will last forever. Wow, I mean, that paints a really beautiful picture of Meghalaya. And I can see uh, why the people over there love your book. And it's, it's great to see the perspective of, you know, such a young mind of, of a, such a beautiful place. So that was beautiful. Please show us your book one more time so that, you know, our yeah. readers will know. This it's is called, the Yeah. And these are the pages. That's great. I see some pictures too. Yes. That's really nice. Zach, please go ahead with your copy. What what will you be reading for us? What uh, Layab said is very true. In this world, everything is ruled over by men. But in my next book, which is Hidden Links, being published by Penguin, Coming, which is out for pre-order right now on Amazon. Oh, is this a free teaser that we're getting? Yes. The book? That's great, that's great. <laughs> it's available for pre-order right now on Amazon. And I trace the, the actual origin of curtailing women. How exactly a band of nomads started out and how they influenced women empowerment in some way or the other. I'll, in fact, read a small uh, excerpt from the end of my women empowerment chapter. In one fell swoop, a set of aggressive male herders who migrated from the steppe regions to escape the harshness of the late Bronze Age climate change altered the global perceptions about women. As they traveled, leaving their women behind, they explored new regions, occupied newer lands, and probably not, delib not deliberately, but eventually created a lopsided masculine genetic ancestry and culture. From then on, the world moved ahead at a breakneck speed. Tremendous progress was made in all the spheres, but unfortunately, the culture of sexism lingered on. Though Hatshepsut, a woman, could ascend the throne of Egypt in 1478 BCE, it took another 3,500 odd years for a Sri Lankan prime minister to take over the first elected head of the nation. Though Agalonis claim gained fame as the, Austri as the astronomer in 1700 BCE, it took us another three and a half millennium to get a modern day lady to have the same task. Thank you. Wow, I mean, I'm, I'm very excited to pick up that book and read now. <laughs> so... I think it's really interesting how you put like, uh, you know, you took the women empowerment uh, aspect and you brought in history and different timelines that people would never expect to, you know, mix in. And I think that's that's really interesting. And I'm sure all our readers are excited to pick up your new book. 
and even the yaab jia book so i think you guys have beautifully painted you, you have such elaborate impressive work that all our readers would love to explore more of your works so i think just a follow up to that um do you have any more upcoming projects that our readers can look uh, look out for like anything any other aspects that interest you or any topics that you for sure know that you want to write something on any zack or nayab any of you can take that up um one thing that is coming out in the near future is of course the the book i just read an excerpt from hidden links which is out for pre-order right now on Amazon and and in most big bookstores it's coming out at i think the end of the next month but you can pre-order it now another thing i'm working on is short form content small youtube shorts and instagram reels to make history more fun for the modern twitter and instagram generation those are two of my future projects here that's great i think a lot you'll find a lot more audience through that and i think it's very interesting how you're trying to make your work more accessible to more people and how you have to you know keep in constant touch with what the targeted audience also wants to see so i think that's pretty impressive so naya uh, any word about your future work yes uh, i'm writing a story that is sledging through the hardships you see many people they come to kashmir to to uh, see the snow clad mountains to witness kashmir's beauty but when i went to uh, gulmarg that is one of the most famous places of kashmir i noticed something which really touched my heart and i felt very sad after seeing it so you see you must uh, be knowing about the sledge pullers where they pull the sledge uh, through the uh, snow and people sit on the sledge and they have fun of the lives so what uh, happened you see when i saw the people the young boys who were pulling the sledges i felt quite sad seeing them because when we hear the word sledge we imagine santa claus riding uh, riding with his deer reindeer but sledging i mean that's not always as easy as that because when i saw the young boys they were so tired they were pulling the sledges just to earn their bread and butter i felt quite sad we just go to places we enjoy and come back but the ones who have to do the real work means i saw through their perspective how it feels so, and plus i'm writing another book which is the midnight train with it's a collection of short stories fiction ones oh please tell us about the midnight train so i think that sounds very interesting okay so the midnight train is a fiction story so in that what happens a young girl uh, she settles down in a new place she comes to a new place due to her, due to her father's job and there one day what happens at night she hears a sound and she thinks that what can it be she at first she thinks that it's a sound of some kind of insect and after some time she realizes no that cannot be possible when she went out in the garden from where the noise was coming to see what was the thing what's the thing which is making the noise she was amazed to find a tiny train uh, in in her garden which was entering into a tiny hole and she stopped the train and then it's a journey afterwards to a magical world where she travel in that train to a different world altogether an underground world oh wow wow i think both the uh, both of your upcoming projects seem very very fascinating to me and you, i'm sure even to our readers and i'm definitely sure that we're going to you know have a book session we'll invite you back to read when once your new projects uh, are released so i think uh, the entire session let's say it's been leading up to this one question all of us want to ask is how are you balancing both your studies at such a young age and also writing books not just reading them but also writing them so how do you keep this passion to stay connected to your passion for you know reading and writing books so zack if we can have you answer that question and then we can go to my app right now my studies are really taking up a lot of my time and i've not been able to have the same amount of time as, as i used to uh, researching studying history writing history so i think most of the book writing process 
happens during the weekends and on and during my summer vacations um but then again a lot of what i did was during the uh, covid covid time period the online class period that time i had a lot of free time right now i'm balancing between my vacations and uh, the weekends yeah that's great that that's amazing naya yes uh speaking about balancing i never actually had to balance it because i have never taken reading and writing as a form of burden they have always been as a form of enjoyment for me and hence i have never i never felt the need to balance it you see when i get any off time uh, i read books or i write stories i take story books to my school and during any off period i just start reading and i enjoy myself doing that so do your peers also encourage you to keep writing to they uh, you know your friends do they read your books do they tell you give you feedback on how it was any stories that you could share with us when well, my friends think that i am a bit weird because nowadays you see children are not into reading and you know they are always into playing video games or mobile phones but they find me they find me quite weird and but, but i don't care because Uh, reading is my passion, and a book lover's passion you can never change. That's amazing. I mean, if your friends are only interested in video games, I'm sure they'll see your future works where they'll they'll be converted to some movies, and then they'll have to watch it. But I guess you do have a community over here. We're all here for you know. We're all pretty enthusiastic about books, and we want to know more about authors and the works that you do. And it's great to have you. uh personally come in and talk to us about your process so that's great zack do you have any friends who you know have spoken to you about your work or any any feedback that you've gotten that you've incorporated in your works um yes in fact even my friends uh are mostly interested in video games but uh yes a lot of them do uh try to have conversations with me try to speak with me on their thoughts on history their perspectives for example I, i was speaking about ashoka i think one of my friends came in and told me why told me why he doesn't think that my perspective uh is a real one at all yes i have had um uh, otherwise also my friends after they read the book to make it more interesting for for them they also give me opinions which and i've incorporated a lot of them in my book yes i think that's really nice that both of you and i think it does i think there is a similarity in both of you that we see that there's been a decline of in the younger generation of you know picking up a book and just reading it because everything is online these days and i think one of the motivation to start abcs is to you know bring back that love of taking that book and making time to read and i think it's amazing that you guys are in the ecosystem of making that happen and Okay so uh, we have one question in chat for you uh, so it is about can you suggest or guide kids who are planning to write a book and how to start and keep the spirit in spite of no support so it's about people who do want to write books but they do not find the support or is there any small advice that you would like to give to the uh, kids out there of your age that would love to write pursue writing nayab any advice you have oh uh, yes i have advice you see um, nowadays people who write they are focusing mainly on the words they use they try to use a lot of high fi words they try to incorporate all the mm, complicated words in their writing and they feel that like that will make their writing better but i feel no that's not the thing it's not the words that you use it but it's about the way you portray your story your ideas and i use very simple words in my writing i write quite simply i write from my heart so that it reaches out to a bigger audience and i don't want to write in a very um, complicated manner so that children don't, don't understand and just for show, and just for showing off i can't you know i can't write for showing off you can say okay so i think that the necessary because a lot of people think your vocabulary and the uh, style of writing only sells so i think 
you should stay true to your authentic self and write something that you are also fascinated about and i think that's a great message now zack what what do you want, what would you like to say to someone who's trying to pursue writing uh, i think the trick is to just believe in yourself not care about what anyone else is saying but i think um in fact the roman orator cicero said that giving a good speech is about stirring the person who's listening to your speech's emotions i think writing is um is a very similar art where you have to stir the person the reader's emotions uh and i think sometimes contrary to what nayab said that might that might involve your vocabulary that um sometimes specific words are used in specific places because they help to change the entire story the entire a uh, piece the work uh yeah that, that's what i would say that's great thank you thank you for answering that and i think because the fireside chat will proceed to the next section where let's take some like very quick questions for the both of you um so one thing is can you give us like top 3 recommendations to someone who is who uh, you know your top 3 and also something something that's very easy for our readers to understand so give us like three recommendations that you would love our readers who are watching here to uh, you know take up in their next to do pile nayab can we start with you well uh, i feel that these are the top three books that uh, children should read but yeah um, apart from these like there's a book called the enchanted wood by anna plighton that's quite a remarkable book then there is the land of stories by chris colfer and last but not the least gobu and the enchanted tooth tool by nayak sohail which is me so i feel that these books will um, instill a passion for reading among children and they'll take them to a different world where troubled souls can find refuge that's great so we have the next three books please back take it away um i usually don't only read history i read various aspects of uh, reality of not fiction uh, i think one book that i came across that was really interesting was the black swan by nasim nicholas taleb it talks about predictability and how whatever we try to predict is actually impossible how all forecasters are technically common uh another good book was free economics by steven levitt it covers a lot of case studies from economics that change your perspective of the world and the last book would of course be um early indians by tony joseph it takes you uh, on a pathway it connects the genetic ancestry of indians of uh, asa which would be ancestral south indians and ana which is ancestral north indians and it takes you on an entire journey tracing um our origins our our roots and of course i would uh, again re- recommend that you buy in my book hidden links it it actually has a lot of ground breaking um new ideas new thoughts including how exactly the rajputs of india are related to the kings of korea or h- how uh, a band of nomads in the steppe region instilled uh, curtailing women into us i think uh, yeah that might also be a good read wow i think both of you gave us like you know the equal amount of fiction non fiction uh, recommendations for our readers and i think that's pretty interesting and i'm sure a lot of people have added all those to their list so last quick question is a small message to all the readers out there and what is it that you hope that the readers take away from your own books and to keep them you know to encourage them to keep on reading naya was like anyone anyone can just take away with that question zack can we yeah oh uh, i didn't hear the end of the question could you repeat so uh, basically give us a small message uh, that the readers and the audience can take away uh, to encourage them to read and what is it that you as a writer hope from your readers to take away from your books um i think the simple message of my book is that 
though most believe that history is is primitive, it's not necessary. I, I believe that it really has an impact on our present and our future. In fact, the, the German philosopher Gorg Hegel says that we can take the small aspects from our past and instill it to make our present and future better. My simple message would be history is cool and history is fun. That's great. I think that is, that's a very simple way of putting it. I, I love that. Nayav, your parting away uh, message, please. Yeah. Yes. So, you see, generally, I don't fight stories with them. I don't fight moral stories. And I feel that stories are not always about having a moral. Sometimes it's just about finding happiness in the writing and finding entertainment. But yes, uh, if I had to give a message, I I would say that one should always read books because if you are a reader tomorrow, today, you will be a leader tomorrow. And as I said earlier, that books are not always about scientific formulas and mathematical facts. Because nowadays uh, in this competitive world, I have seen children uh, studying like mad. They are studying to crack meat. They are studying to uh, crack UPSC. But that's not the thing, actually, basically. So uh, books, you, you have to discover the magic of books. You have to, mm, yes, you have to basically discover the magic of books. That's great. And I'm sure all our readers loved this entire session. And thank you. Thank you so much, Zach and Nayab, for joining us today and sharing all your valuable experiences. We also extend the, our heartfelt appreciation to both of your parents uh, for their coordination. We sincerely thank them. And I think uh, we're coming to the end of the session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Zach and Nayab. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you uh, with you know a lot of your new works and we get to see you live doing more interviews to uh, you know getting the fame and all of the recognition that you for all of your works and they're really really beautiful and very impressive work and I'm urging anybody who's like watching right now to uh, check out their works it's, it's really beautiful I even I myself I'm gonna pick up their books and actually read them and thank you for your takes thank you for your you know, sharing your valuable, valuable experiences with all of our readers. And thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was wonderful speaking to you all. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here. An honor. So as we conclude the session, uh, we'd like to provide a glimpse of what's in store for the next session. Uh, we are anticipating a stronger audience presence in the next session. And just to build a more vibrant book community. So I encourage every one of you to continue the fostering the love of reading and joining us for our next event. So before we wrap up, we also extend the invitation to authors or anyone who knows someone interested in sharing their work with a Pan India Book Club Association. And we would be delighted to have you here directly interacting with our audience. So thank you, Zach and Nayab, for being a part of this part of this inaugural event thank you for making it a grand success so hope you really hope to all of the audience out there thank you so much hope you enjoy the session and happy reading thank you thank you thank you very much thank you ma'am bye bye now thank you Zach. thank you bye next